Good morning, and welcome to this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. We have one item on our agenda this morning, a decisional matter on the FY 2019 mid-year review. CPSC staff members are with us this morning in case there are any questions for staff in the opening round. Mr. Dwayne Ray, our Deputy Executive Director for Safety Operations, and Mr. Jay Hoffman, our Director of Financial Management. Good morning to both of you this morning. They are at the table, uh, but additional staff are in the audience as well, should their expertise be needed or are there any questions for them. Each commissioner will have five minutes for their questions and we can go multiple rounds if necessary. Following questions for the staff, we will then turn to the consideration of the mid-year proposal. This morning, I do not have any additional questions for either one of you. Commissioner Adler? No questions, thank you. Commissioner Kay? No, thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Bielko? No, thank you. Commissioner Feldman? No questions at this time, thank you. Well, you're, you're both, uh, you can leave, and for the moment, that's correct. Um, and we will proceed with our discussion of the 2019 mid-year Thank you both very much for being here. We're now gonna to turn to the FY 2019 mid-year review as proposed by staff and any amendments to the proposal. So this morning I will begin uh, with my amendment. As usual at mid-year, all of the commissioners have their own ideas about which projects identified by the staff should get the highest priority. We decided, I think, pretty much across the commission to omit one project known to all of us as NCARES. This project represents a forward thinking way to get valuable information on exposure to consumer products. This information I think would be helpful in rulemaking and prioritizing our work. In my opinion, I thought that this project is one that's worthy of the high priority given to it by the staff, but it also comes with a very high price tag and that makes it challenging um, to take that over some other uh, perhaps more safety related initiative. I asked staff uh, during our briefing whether it would be possible to launch some sort of an NCARES project as a pilot, but it was difficult. Uh, first of all, it was going to remain uh, expensive uh, not quite as much as the entire project would have, but the risk would be uh, an investment if then we abandon it later. So the solution for right now is to leave it, uh, leave NCARES out of the lineup that was presented in our original um, package that came up to us from the staff. Without NCARES, it is likely that most of the remaining projects will end up being funded in this fiscal year. If approved, projects will be funded in priority order, subject to sufficient availability of un un unexecuted balances and acquisition feasibility. My amendment, my amendment uh, reflects, I'll call it a rough consensus among the commissioners in the order of projects and how they, um, how they are listed in the table this morning. However, I will say, that more likely than not with the removal of NCARES, most of these projects will be funded. And, and quite frankly, the order um, in the amendment is not what I would have done on my own. Uh, I would have preferred to see, as staff had put it in, saferproducts.gov up at the number four level. Uh, it was moved down uh, to a lower number in the list, but again, the hope is it will get funded. Um, but in the spirit of compromise and comedy, uh, within the commission offices, I think it's important that we try to settle on something that we can all live with. So I will make a motion uh, on my amendment, and I would need a second. I second it. Thank you very much. Uh, having heard a second, we'll now move to consideration of my amendment. Um, commissioners may ask their questions, and then you come back to me, and uh, or yield me your time for any questions you might have, and. Um, and we'll have, each commissioner will have five minutes um, per round of questioning. Commissioner Adler. Uh, I don't have any questions, but I do have several quick comments. Uh, first of all, 
the, f the two first projects there, I th assume are really worthy projects. I've had them explained to me several times, and in all honesty, I'm not certain I understand them completely, but I fully trust the staff who have put these together, including the staff's commitment that uh, they're moving into uncharted territory here, and so in the event that they find uh, that they've drilled some dry holes, I don't think they should worry about that, but I think they should then be willing to come back and report to us that uh, some of the initiatives in this are probably not working out, and I'm fine with that. I just wanted to signal that. Uh, I also want to uh, thank the chairman for, and uh, my fellow commissioners, for the spirit of compromise that we approached uh, listing these priority projects in. Um, I don't know whether you would call it a Sophie's choice, a choice between a rock and a hard place, uh, choosing between two members of your family, but uh, when you have to select among worthy projects, it gets to be very, very painful, and uh, so many of these are worthy projects, so the listing in priority fashion absolutely does not reflect the priority. I would put them in either, uh, Chairman Burkle, but I do appreciate your spirit of compromise and the spirit of compromise of my colleagues, so I'm prepared to support this. Thank you very much, Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I don't have any questions either. I'm going to echo Commissioner Adler's comments. I do really appreciate your leadership on this and putting together a list that works for all of us and recognizing, as you said, it wouldn't be the list you would have come up with. Uh, it probably may not end up being the list any of us would have done on our own, but I think in, in it we can all see something that we're happy with, and that's good enough for me, so I plan to support it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner Kay. Commissioner Bioko. Um, well, Acting Chair Burkle, I think I'd like to help you out with your comment that you would have preferred to see the saferproducts.gov moved up to number four. I would move to amend your amendment to, to do so and move everything um, behind it down because I believe that you know, we've had two hearings on this matter and to put it in the slot that it is, I think, does not give it the, sh the, sh the attention that it absolutely needs. And um, so I, I would move to... Move it into slot number four. We'll need a second. I'll second it. Is there any discussion on this amendment, Commissioner Adler? Um, I'm going to oppose the amendment again because the minute we start tinkering with this, it's like one of these jerry-rigged things. You remove one brick and the whole thing collapses uh, because I can think of things that I would move up uh, even beyond safer products. I think you make a good point about the necessity of doing this. I will say that the price tag for this uh, is $590,000. That wouldn't have been what I thought we were committing ourselves to do when we talked about modernization, but I'm assured that it is a complex undertaking to do that because so many of the parts are moving parts that are connected to one another. So uh, while I am reluctantly prepared to commit uh, to the expenditure of these funds, I am not prepared to start tinkering with this uh, without including some of the things I'd like to tinker with, and then I think we, we probably would fall into some kind of controlled chaos, so I'm going to oppose it. Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to Commissioner Bayako for the amendment to the amendment. And let me just, if I can, offer my thoughts on why I'm going to oppose it too. And it has nothing to do with the merits of the Safer Products um, proposal, it, and it has to do with where we understand the cutoff financially and what would get funded and what wouldn't. And that's my concern. And so my understanding is as we have it now, and of course, Madam Chair, please correct me if I'm wrong, that roughly we would expect to get through the nine projects, maybe 10, and have those funded. But my concern is if we move safer products up, it could potentially put at risk some of those lower level projects. And the one that I'm most concerned about is lithium ion batteries. And I, and I appreciate that, Madam Chair, you moved that up earlier in this. That was one of the accommodations that you made because we've invested so much appropriately in this area as we should. It does these products for all the value that they offer do present some pretty serious risks. And it's been good for the public that we've spent the time on this. So I would be concerned about what this would do to the funding of some of the items if this were moved. So feeling comfortable that safer products still should get funding under the current list, I'm going to go and as will the rest of the projects and go ahead and oppose this. But please don't take that as a statement of anything that you've offered. It really has to do with trying to preserve the delicate balance of what would get funded. Thank you. 
Thank you. Commissioner Feldman. I have no questions at this time. Thank you. Mr. Bioko, would you like to respond to any of the concerns? Um, I would. Um, actually, I think that in looking at the, the, the large number, and I do think it's a large number on saferproducts.gov, but I also think there's a, a significantly large number on ATV stability and rollover, which is also a good project, but we've been working on that for quite some time. Um, and it's a large amount of taxpayer funds contributing to a project that deals with only one class of products, whereas saferproducts.gov uh, applies to everyone, and it is something that needs to be done, has a, uh, in my opinion, a broader reach, a, a more, um, a more effective way if it's done right, and that's why we would spend the money on getting it up to speed. It has, it has a broader reach, and it s serves and helps more of the American consumer than one particular type of product. And therefore, I think it is absolutely something that needs to be funded, needs to be done. We told um, our witnesses at the hearing that they had you know, legitimate um, points, and I don't want to go back on that. So I would... Um, I, I would counter. One, one other point that I do want to make is I, I too, Commissioner Kay, am, am very focused on lithium-ion batteries and was uh, disappointed to see that it ended up in the number eight slot because I had it much higher. Thank you. And uh, before I call the vote, my comment, and first of all, let me express my appreciation. I really do appreciate that you would be willing to move that up, um, the saferproducts.gov modernization. I am confident, uh, as I look at these numbers, if we get down to item number 10, and perhaps we can call Mr. Hoffman back to the table, but it looks to me like if we have funding through item number 10, which gets us to about 3.8 million at the very, at the least, so conceivably we could go beyond that. This, the sheet here talks about $4,055,000. Um, the estimate of these projects. So I, th I have a confidence that this will get funded. And so in the interest of not having the entire, um, all of the, as, as Commissioner Adler said, all of the bricks fall, uh, I'm concerned that we continue with our plan having full confidence that saferproducts.gov modernization will get funded. Because I think, to Commissioner Bialko's point, we had a hearing of, uh, here, and we brought in the public to comment on the importance of saferproducts.gov. It is something that we have been asked to deal with, to look at, to modernize, to make sure we're letting consumers know that it even exists. We're contemplating other ways to put the information about the platform out so that the consumer will know it exists. And rather than complaining to their online uh, about a safety issue to their to the platform, they will think that saferproducts.gov exists and it will only enhance and enrich our data. So I, but given my confidence level with regards that it will get funded, um, Mr. Hoffman, I don't know if you have anything to add to that question or to that. Okay. Uh, it looks to me that we have about 3.8 million if we fund through item 10. So uh, that gives me a confidence level that saferproducts.gov will be funded. If, I'm, if I might respond, if that's the case, then I believe we should send a message that um, we are taking seriously from a priority perspective, saferproducts.gov, and move it up into the spot that I believe, um, and Marie, you, you mentioned what you've preferred to see it in number four. So if they're all going to get funding, let's put it in a, a, a priority spot um, to make sure that we're communicating we are serious about this. Thank you. Um, and if I can respond to that, my concern is that if we move it up and, and I have a confidence level that it will be funded at this level, that I won't get we won't get support for your amendment. And then we will be in a situation where it stays the same and we may lose some support in, for the package as a whole. Okay, well, let's, let's see what kind of support we have. Thank you. So we will take a, uh, does anyone have any other questions or concerns? We will take a vote on the amendment to the amendment. Um, Commissioner Adler, how do you vote? No. Commissioner Kay? No. Commissioner Bioko? Yes. Commissioner Feldman? Yes. And I vote no. Um, so the no's are three, the ayes are two, and uh, 
the amendment to the amendment does not pass. We will now proceed back to my amendment. Um, are there any other comments or questions about my fir the First Amendment to the mid-year? So uh, I will call a vote on the on amendment, what we're calling amendment number one, but it is the list of the um, of the projects that would be funded in mid-year. Commissioner Adler, how do you vote? I vote aye. Commissioner Kay? Aye. Commissioner Bayoko? Yes. Commissioner Feldman? Yes. And I vote aye. The ayes are five, the nays are zero. So amendment number one passes. Are there any other amendments here this morning on the mid-year? Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I have an amendment which has been distributed I, to uh, the commissioners. Uh, it's a joint amendment from Commissioner Kay and me, and it relates to uh, the addition of a project uh, in mid-year on children's clothing storage unit uh, tip-over hazards uh, from Section 104. Uh, you all see the amendment, and if I might just say a few words about this. Uh, first of all, excuse me, Commissioner yeah. Heather, we need um, oh, a, I'm second sorry, I need a second to your amendment. Good. I second. Thank you very much. Um, I realize, Commissioner Kay realizes that a majority of the commission voted down this proposal to have the commission develop a 104 rule for children's clothing storage units. Uh, what we are proposing today is different uh, from our previous proposal at the budget time. This proposal simply seeks a listing of a 104 rule as DATR, which is Data Analysis Technical Review in the mid-year, as an additional option for consideration as staff works on the rule to be developed under Section 7 and 9. Let me be clear. This proposal does not seek any additional funding or staff work in FY 2019 beyond that which is currently underway with respect to the Section 7, Section 9 rule. What we're proposing is to be prepared for the day when staff has completed all the technical work for a safety standard and the commission is then contemplating the next step. Should it come to pass, as Commissioner Kay and I believe it will, that the necessary staff work uh, after the technical work is done from epidemiology, econ, uh, OGC to complete a Section 7 and Section 9 standard will take many, many more months, if not years, to do. We would like for the Commission at that point, once the technical work is done, to be able to take an interim step of drafting a 104 rule quickly with minimum fuss without significantly slowing the work on a Section 7 and Section 9 rule. Uh, what I want to say is keeping the option of doing a 104 rule will guarantee that our friends in industry will take the Commission's commitment to safety seriously, which I doubt that they're doing now. We hear reports from the ASTM committee, and it's all negative news, and it's all oppositional on the part of the industry. If we were to take this action, that will set the stage to alert the industry that the Commission uh, is serious and a broader standard is coming. And I just want to remind people why we feel so strongly about a 104 rule, which admittedly will not cover all of the products in the market, but it will cover a significant number of them. This is something that can be done quickly, efficiently, without exposing the rule to a likely legal challenge, or maybe to say a likely successful legal challenge, unlike a rule developed under Section 7 and 9. And one of the things we've seen with Section 7 and 9 rules, and I guarantee we will see it in this case, uh, the industry is going to wait till the penultimate moment before we mandate a Section 7 and 7, 9, and 9 rule, and then they will come in with a highly flawed last-minute uh, study that we need to do, and they will insist that we stop until we address the issues that they've raised. And then they will submit a uh, voluntary standard that will be a 60 percent solution that they hope will just barely cross the bar for the commission uh, under its statute to have to defer or to rely on that. Uh, we've seen this time and time again. Uh, I think we should say we are not prepared to do that. So our motion, our amendment is let's keep our options open for a 104 rule to be a first and significant step towards safety. It won't cost anything, but it will send a strong signal to the market that we're serious about protecting kids.
Thank you, Commissioner Adler. The commissioners and uh, we will have our opportunity to ask questions of you and then following those questions, uh, you will have time to answer those questions. Um, as Commissioner Adler pointed out, um, the commission did vote against adding this project to the 2020 budget and I've not changed my mind uh, on this project uh, within this context of 104. I think everyone up here in the dais is committed to solving the problem of tip overs. Each one of us have, uh, have different ideas and thoughts and have pursued this vigorously. Um, I think that the proposed entry into the mandatory standards table is a misnomer. Section 104 is not about children's products. It is about durable nursery products, also called the durable infant and toddler products. I question whether there are any sto clothing storage units on the market today that are specifically designed to be for infants or toddlers. As we all know and recognize, this is a very broad issue as we contemplate uh, dressers at a lower height and many of the other issues with regards to this issue. Um, this would just address a very narrow group of those dressers. Even if there are, I know of no voluntary standard that specifically addresses such clothing storage units. In my opinion then, the amendment does not fall within our legal authority under section 104. The staff is not planning this work in the current fiscal year, therefore staff can't undertake this work unless they are relieved of a different project that is currently required under the operating plan. Uh, and I will say to that, unfortunately here at the CPSC, our bench is not all that, it's not very deep. And so when we take staff working on a project, it's probably gonna be related to tip over issue. And that means that would be taken away from an issue that's in the ops plan that we've identified as an agency that's a priority and must be worked on to work on this. Um, and having done that, that would require, I believe, uh, under uh, an offset within, and I don't think anyone has been identified. Um, for all these reasons, I will continue to oppose this amendment, but I wanna thank my colleague for um, contemplating a solution to this issue. It's something that each one of us up here at the dais takes very, very seriously. Commissioner Kay. Excuse me, may I, may I ask a point of clarification? Um, with regard to this particular proposed amendment and, and the um, ones that are going to be followed, uh, following. I, I apologize, Commissioner Bayoko, we will get to you after. No, 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 no. Uh, my question is, is this a, um, are these amendments to the mid-year or are these amendments to the op plan? Uh, that's, I just this is an know. amendment to the mid-year with implications obviously for the op plan the as, it, as are many of the proposals. So when you say on page nine, you're really referring to the op plan, right? Yes. Okay. So, but, so yeah, I guess that's why I'm confused. Wouldn't it be? It's probably form over substance, but um, if we're moving on an amendment, it would be an amendment to add this language to the op plan. Uh, this is a point that we have debated a number of times, and I have very strong feelings about this. Uh, so many of the decisions that we make with respect to resources ultimately come back to the op plan. My view is we can raise any issue at any time uh, as long as we understand that when we voted on an issue that it will be actualized uh, or materialized in the op plan. But the idea that we should tie our hands and only once a year be able to talk about the commitment of resources it is not something that I agree with. I, I don't think that's what I'm asking. I, I, I was just wondering if it shouldn't be titled. Um, I, I think it's fine if you want to propose an amendment at any time, frankly. Um, I just wanted to make sure that I understood where it went. I said it was just a point of clarification. Thank you, Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you to my fellow Commissioner Adler for jointly offering this. Uh, I wanted to just talk about the practical aspects of why we're offering it because I agree with the Chair that we all are focused on trying to resolve tip overs and being as comprehensive as possible about it. From my experience, and Commissioner Adler laid out some of the ways that this goes down, that the status quo is not working. I think we can all agree on that, that what we're seeing occurring right now in the voluntary standards process is not a path to success and certainly not a quick path to success. And so what will be the dynamic that will change that? And historically, what has changed that is when the CPSC staff 
has a breakthrough, a technical breakthrough, and then brings that technical breakthrough to the voluntary standards body and then also uh, starts to work on a rulemaking associated with that technical breakthrough. We saw that happen with um, with ROVs. We saw that happen uh, with portable generators. And up until that point, we were told, the agency was told, the public was told that it was not feasible, wasn't possible to do X, and the staff has always proved that X is possible and feasible. And so the point of this amendment, at least from my perspective, is not actually to create work because it wouldn't create work. It would actually make less work for staff. And it is only titled the DOTR, so it doesn't actually add any obligations for the staff for this year. And it only reflects the work that staff is already doing under the Section 7 and 9 rulemaking. But the relevance of it, and I realize this is hyper-technical and inside baseball, but the relevance of it is that when staff drafts a rule pursuant to 104, they are freer and have fewer obligations and fewer uh, findings to have to make, and they can focus exclusively on the technical issues that they're trying to solve. And so what I think Commissioner Adler and I are trying to get to here is to free them up to not have to be burdened by those unnecessary findings and to allow them to more quickly identify the technical solutions and then, this is just as relevant, get those technical solutions public because in the event that they have to move under seven and nine, it will still take a very long time for them to draft a number of memos associated with findings that are extraneous to the technical solutions. I'm not saying they're irrelevant, but they're extraneous to the technical solutions. And that's just time we're not spending of these issues being presented publicly, especially the voluntary standards body, and moving this forward. I do think that there is an urgency here that is unique. I think that the agency has struggled with this issue for a number of years. We all know how the parents are on this issue. We know how the Hill feels about this issue. There may or may not be legislative relief coming. And I think we should be doing everything we can to be taking advantage of every tool we have and getting staff, giving, freeing them up to move as quickly as possible to present those technical findings without any additional work. So I would gently uh, reject the idea that it would require more work. I would actually say it would require less work than what's proposed in the operating plan for FY19. And I think it would definitely be the step needed to break the currently unsuccessful status quo. So that's why I'm again offering it with my colleague. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Bioko. No comments I haven't made before. Commissioner Feldman. Thank you. Um, I, at the outset, you know, I uh, want to state that uh, I appreciate the de dedication that my fellow commissioners are bringing and continue to bring to this issue uh, in, in uh, looking for creative solutions to uh, a, a very serious problem that's before the agency and that um, I, I think we've been able to find some consensus on previously, um, and I, I, I do think we're all taking this very seriously. Um, ultimately, uh, I, I'm supportive of the underlying goal here. I don't think I'm supportive of the particular vehicle um, for the reasons I've stated previously, including that a 104 rule would cover only a narrow segment of the market, um, and that because proceeding with a 104 rulemaking would pull critical staff out of um, the mandatory rulemaking for seven and nine, um, that we've recently unanimously voted to expedite. Um, I, I have concerns about proceeding with a, a Section 104 rulemaking. Um, you could also make the argument that because we're currently, uh, because the 7 and 9 mandatory rulemaking is already in the FY 2019 ops plan, excuse me, the FY 20 ops plan, um, that, uh, that, that we have staff in place to do this work and that any data analysis that's going to be undertaken in the 7 and 9 process would inform the 104 process as well. Uh, so therefore, I, I question the, the, the underlying need for this, if that works already on a path to being completed. Um, but but uh, I, 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 I hope that we're going to continue to work together on this. I, I'm a no vote on the amendment, but uh, I appreciate the effort. Thank you, Commissioner Feldman. Are there any other questions? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you. I, uh, first of all, thank you for the general support for doing uh, uh, important work on addressing tip overs. And I'm delighted to see that we have a consensus among the commissioners for pushing that as hard as possible. Uh, just a couple of uh, record uh, corrections. Um, to, to say that we would not have the legal authority to do a 104 rule for children's clothing storage units to me uh, is is disturbing because that is tying our hands for future action. In a sense, it's uh, 
it's putting a blemish on some work that we've already done. Um, if you look at the parents uh, who've had lost children, those children are toddlers, and th this is exactly the group that both the uh, 104 rule would address and as the Section 79 rule would address and that the voluntary standard addresses. Uh, I would hate to see a precedent where we have such a self-imposed uh, embargo on our ability to uh, employ Section 104 uh, in a fairly expansive way. Uh, the critical thing, and, and I certainly uh, take to heart uh, Commissioner Feldman's concern about the uh, skewing of our resources. This does not require any additional resources for FY 2019. It sends a signal to the world about how serious we are with respect to uh, tip over hazards, and it says to uh, our friends in the industry, something is going to happen. You need to take immediate action, and you need to pay immediate attention and not engage in the kind of gamesmanship that has plagued this commission for so many years. So um, I certainly take my colleagues' uh, concerns to heart, and I'm going to restrain myself when we get to the inflection point where we suddenly realize that we've spent all this time doing technical work, which is adequate for a 104 rule and for 709, and then the staff is coming in and saying, oh, by the way, it will be another two years before we can complete all the EPI work, all the econ work, all the legal analysis, and I will do my best not to say, I told you so. Thank you, Commissioner Adler. Are there any other questions for Commissioner Adler or Commissioner Kay? I will call the vote on the Commissioner uh, Kay L Adler Amendment. Commissioner Adler, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Kay? Aye. Commissioner Bioko? No. Commissioner Feldman? No. And I vote no. The ayes are two and the uh, nays are three. This amendment does not pass. Are there additional amendments um, for the mid-year? I do have additional joint amendments to offer, Madam Chair. May I proceed? You may proceed, please. Thank you. So I'm going to offer what we're calling joint um, Adler K Amendment Number 2. And uh, I'll briefly describe it and then ask for a second. The point of this amendment is basically to provide further transparency to the public by denoting those goals in the FY 2019 operating plan that staff is currently able to identify as work we will not meet before the end of the fiscal year. So it, it's staff driven in the sense that staff gets to decide which projects they already know they're not going to meet. And I think if they already know that, it's important to notify the public. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. We will now uh, proceed with questions from the commissioners. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I will begin. Um, I guess I just have a couple of comments on amendment, I'll, and it's been referred to as K. Adler II. Um, and I, I, I want to just mention a couple of things. First of all, it, it is true that uh, under the former chairman, the staff sometimes did use the mid-year as the occasion for communicating milestones required by the operating plan had slipped. Um, for example, if some of the final rule or notices of proposed rulemaking were not on track, the operating plan then would be revised to reflect uh, a less, I'll call it, ambitious goal. Um, in this mid-year package, uh, there was actually a more intentional way of, of looking at how we use the operating plan, um, but I think the executive director uh, who puts together along with staff the recommendations to us um, wanted to take a slightly I'll call it a tougher stand. Um, and it's not, certainly not because we wanted to be less transparent, but the old approach could send a message that there was flexibility. And I think um, what the executive director has communicated to staff and what the commissioners have all asked for, if you don't think it's going to be on time or timely, please let us know that. But not amending the operating plan um, is uh, something that we're not, uh, at, in, at least in this mid-year, uh, was not contemplated. Um, I'm happy to say that I think staff is doing a very good job of staying on track despite some difficult obstacles. 
I will men mention the uh, lengthy shutdown at the beginning of this year, which really disadvantaged so many of the staff as well as the agency uh, in, in order to in accomplish their goals. And at the end of the year, the Commission's annual report will reflect the status of all of these projects and it, there will be transparency. Uh, the staff does not support this amendment, uh, nor do I. And those are my comments. Commissioner Adler. Thank you very much. I just wanted to add a word or two to uh, Commissioner Kay's very, very thorough description of this and of the intent. Uh, this is not intended to be a criticism of anybody. This is just a recognition of reality. This is... Uh, sending a signal to the world about what the workflow is at the agency. And it's also a way of uh, involving the public in uh, the Commission's progress. Uh, I don't want to rehash old arguments, but I have a feeling that language like this will pop up when it comes to tip over very, very soon. But this is simply for an agency that uh, holds itself out as one of the most open and transparent agencies, an additional way of being open and transparent. Thank you, Commissioner Adler. Commissioner Bioko. Um, I support this amendment. I think that uh, the uh, by not putting it in the operating plan, uh, it, it signals to the public that these goals, as outlined in the operating plan, will be met. And if we know that there are certain goals that are not going to be met, I see no downside to letting the public know uh, of that of that fact. So I would support this. Thank you, Commissioner Feldman. I have no questions. Thank you. Thank you. At this. Commissioner Kay. If I just may go, I, and I, I just want to say that I completely agree, Madam Chair, with what you said about um, not changing the goals. And none of, just to clarify, the amendment would not actually change the goals. So we're in agreement on that. I'm comfortable with not changing the goals. I just think, as Commissioner Biaco said, the public deserves to know if we already know something. And we just had our priorities hearing. We ask a lot of the public to come in and tell us what their priorities are. I'm sure there are things on this list that could get denoted as not being met, that if we know that information now, to Commissioner Bayako's point, I don't know why we wouldn't just tell the public. That doesn't change the operating plan. It doesn't move the goalposts. It just lets the public know, hey, we're just not going to make it on this one. And yes, we do report at the end of the year. I re appreciate that as well. But there's a timing mechanism, and that's months and months down the line. And I think it's important, again, for the public to have timely notice once we know it of when we're not going to meet these goals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Kay. I will call the vote on Amendment Number 2, uh, Adler. K, amendment number two. Uh, Commissioner Adler, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner K? Aye. Commissioner Bioko? Aye. Commissioner Feldman? Aye. And I vote no. Uh, the ayes are four, the nays are one. Um, the mo amendment does pass. Um, are there any other amendments here this morning? There are. There are a few more at least. Thank you, Madam Chair, if I may go. Uh, next, I'd like to offer what we're calling um, Joint Amendment or Joint K, Adler Amendment 3, and this is associated with hazards uh, with inclined sleep products. And briefly, this the changes that we're proposing would direct staff to implement a three-pronged approach to protect consumers from hazards associated with these products. It would provide direction to staff to develop voluntary standards for in infant inclined sleep products that eliminate the hazard patterns associated with these products. And importantly, that would be through performance standards. It would also direct staff to survey the marketplace for infant inclined sleepers, including products entering the stream of commerce at import, and to pursue appropriate actions if the product poses a hazard. I'll have more to say when it's my turn, but that's the point of the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a second? A second. We will now begin our round. Of Commissioner Kay, you want to explain the amendment further? Sure. Thanks, Madam Chair. I mean, obviously, we've recently taken action on these products that um, I certainly thought was warranted and overdue. Um, I've said this before. I thought that, in retrospect, the agency made a mistake in carving out from the bassinet standard this class of products. If we were to do it all over again, I would not recommend that we take that approach. 
I think ideally that this class of products would not, bless you, would not have uh, a 104 associated with it, but my understanding is that attempts to try to um, close out that 104 process, or at least the voluntary standard, were not successful. So plan B is to say if ASTM is going to continue with having this as a separate standard, then we at least make sure that the staff goes into those meetings with extra um, emphasis from the commission that we really need a performance standard to address these products. One, one of the things that we hear all the time from parents is, I just assumed if it was on the market that it was safe. And as robust and as uh, protective of the 104s have been, I think we all recognize that there are gaps. And one of the things that has deeply concerned us all is that products do come on the market, especially sleep products for infants, and they fall within these gaps, and they have sometimes become deadly for kids. And so I do think that we need to accelerate efforts in the voluntary standard if it's going to continue to be a viable standard to create performance standards to address the known hazards. And then I think we also need to address the vacuum that currently exists on the marketplace where even though we've taken action against some of these products, we've not taken action against all of them. There is no reason why more products can't continue to be sold. And I would like to see us be more aggressive about dealing with those products and sending the message that we have certain sleep environments that we feel are uh, have peer-reviewed scientific basis to recommend. We do recommend those sleep environments, and we should keep encouraging parents to be using those sleep environments while using our enforcement authority to deal with those that don't provide that same basis of safety. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Kay. Commissioner Ayler, do you have anything to add to Commissioner Kay's comments? I do, uh, and I thank uh, Commissioner Kay for taking the lead on this. I think this is a, a worthy uh, project to undertake, but I do want to uh, voice a word of caution. Uh, Commissioner Kay said if it's going to continue to be on the market, uh, I wouldn't want anybody to read this motion as blessing the continuation of a standard for inclined sleep products, and I think the uh, devil's in the details, and I think we've gotten the details right because it calls for peer-reviewed, evidence-based, infant-safe sleep pra practices. I have a feeling that when they've investigated this thoroughly, uh, they will probably draw a conclusion that infant uh, inclined sleep products probably shouldn't be on the market, and I wouldn't want anybody to misinterpret the intent of this amendment. Thank you, Commissioner Adler. We will begin our round of questions. Uh, I will begin. Um, first of all, I think just as with the tip over issue, this is an issue that has been before the commission. It's something we are all gravely concerned about and we have uh, begun to deal with it uh, in the two recent recalls that have uh, taken place. As I see this amendment, I see three components to it. The voluntary standard direction, compliance direction, and import surveillance direction. I think on the voluntary standards direction, uh, the operating plan already contemplates work on this issue. Uh, and I, our recent recalls of infant and client sleepers reflect, I believe, a new thinking on the part of staff. I have discussed this issue with the executive director on an, and we've talked about a number of approaches uh, going forward, including which category of products should continue to exist or whether it should have markedly different performance requirements. Uh, and as Commissioner Kay pointed out, I have talked with uh, many of the consumer groups and many of the constituents out there as well as uh, parents. And this is an issue that they are begging us to take a closer look at. And I believe because it is in the, 20, the uh, 2019 Ops Plan, it is uh, staff is doing that work that I think we are where we need to be. Uh, there has already been a voluntary standards meeting last week. Um, and staff, of course, participated. I think as to the compliance and the import surveillance aspects of the amendment, um, I can assure the commissioner and my, my colleagues up here at the dais that these steps are already being taken. We are looking very closely for non-compliant products out in the marketplace today as we speak, as well as those products coming into the country. These, these activities are already occurring. And so um, I think that this, it, Given what is going on within the agency, I really don't think the amendment serves any further purpose um, at this point. Commissioner Bioko. Nothing. Commissioner Feldman. I have no questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Adler or Kay, would you like to respond? 
None. Thank you. Thank you. So we will call the vote. Uh, Commissioner K or uh, Edler, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner K. Aye. Commissioner Bioko. I'm abstaining. Commissioner Feldman. No. And I vote no. There are two ayes, two nays, and one abstention. The amendment does not pass as voted upon. We will now turn to the next amendment on our agenda, which is K. Edler, number four. Thank you, Madam Chair. Two more to go, on, at least for the joint amendment. So as you mentioned, um, I'm offering joint K. Adler amendment number four, which is involving including ROV death and injury data in the annual ATV report. And the purpose of that is to capture staff work or to at least encourage a little bit of extra staff work potentially uh, that is de minimis to include in the ATV report for this fiscal year some information about ROVs, the deaths and injuries associated with them. My understanding is that in order to produce the ATV report, staff already has to sift through this data. So instead of uh, just sort of, not that they discard the data, but instead of putting it aside for the purposes of deeming them not ATVs, just take that same data and publish it and with the hope that in future year we will see um, more robust publishing of ATV and ROV data, uh, or at least ROV data. We've certainly seen an increase in ROV usage, and it does seem important that we update our annual reporting to reflect this change in the marketplace. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Commissioner Kay, would you like to explain further? I have no further comments. Thank you. Commissioner Adler, anything to add to amendment number four? I do. Um, one of the disgraceful episodes in the history of the Commission's regulation of ATVs and ROVs was when the industry came in, uh, again, at the penultimate moment when the Commission was poised to develop a standard, a mandatory standard for ROVs, and they put in an appropriations rider that said we could not expend any resources to do further work towards a, the a mandatory standard. Uh, eventually, we worked out what may well be a perfectly adequate voluntary standard. It was only, as Commissioner Case pointed out, just when we were on the verge of issuing a mandatory standard that we seemed to get the attention of the industry. Uh, it's been several years since we uh, uh, worked with the industry on the voluntary standard, and I honestly don't have any uh, idea whether it's actually reducing injuries and fatalities. So I think making explicit uh, the addressing of ROV injuries and fatalities is a is a very very useful step. Thank you, Commissioner. We will now begin the round of question by the commissioners. Uh, I will begin. Um, and let me just I want to clarify a point that Commissioner Adler just mentioned about a disgraceful episode with regards to the rider, I believe the timing, I would have to check my records, but I believe the timing of the rider came after staff recommended that we terminate the rule and, and provided us with a package. Um, um, that, that is not correct, but we can check the record. We can check the record on that issue, but uh, staff did recommend terminating the rulemaking on that issue. But on this specific amendment, um, Staff has advised me they're already planning to include some information on ROVs in this year's annual report. Specifically, they plan to include a table with information on ROV incidents that have been identified because they were originally classified as ATV incidents, and our staff was able to determine that the incident involved an ROV rather than an ATV. When ROVs first came out, they were often referred to as side-by-side -side ATVs. Some people refer to them that way still. Hence, it's easy to see how things are, can be misclassified. In short, for the annual report now being prepared uh, and being worked on, the staff is not planning to provide extensive incident information on ROVs, but only for the subset of misclassified cases. Since the staff is already doing what it can do for this year, there is no need for the amendment, and therefore I will oppose it. But I do want to say, and I appreciate my colleagues raising this issue and putting forth this amendment. This is something we have talked about, and I believe uh, there is, at least from my perspective, an agreement that this data should be separated out, and I have said that uh, on prior occasions. I do think right now with the limited, uh, that it is being done with the subset of the misclassified ROVs and ATVs, 
However, going forward, I think there is, this is something the consumer groups have asked for, you have asked for, and I believe it would benefit the agency and give us clarity on the data uh, to separate out the ROV and the ATV injuries incidents. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bayoko? Nothing, thank you. Commissioner Feldman? ATVs and ROVs are distinct product categories, and uh, especially given the confusion and misclassification between ROVs and ATVs that we've seen to date, I'm concerned that the commission not take steps to further conflate the two. Therefore, I'm a no on this. That said, to the extent that, uh, that the commission has a purview into uh, market surveillance with respect to both of these product categories, I'm all for the agency collecting, receiving, and being fully transparent with all the data that it collects. It would just be my hope that we do so in a way that doesn't conflate two distinct product categories. So I'd be happy to work with you further. I appreciate the amendment, and I'm glad that I had an opportunity to review it. Uh, I, I, I support the underlying goal of uh, data-driven decision-making and transparency. Uh, unfortunately, I'm a, I'm a no, but, but I, I hope we can continue to work together. Thank you, Commissioner Feldman. Commissioner Kay or Adler, would you like to respond to uh, Only briefly to Commissioner Feldman's point, which I think is a fair one. Uh, there's certainly a lot of confusion. We even see it during Hill hearings when somebody will ask us a question about one product and we already know that they're not talking about that product and we try not to embarrass them in our answer. Uh, so that's a real issue. I think that that's probably um, ameliorated going forward with separate reports. I'm not asking for separate reports. I mean, I'm going to leave that up to the chairman and staff to propose in the operating plan. So I think that will probably get dealt with. I think we're just talking about what happens the remainder of this year. It sounds like uh, there will be some, some information put in there. Uh, so I think we're just going to have to wait and see and hope that that's a good springboard. Uh, but we're getting close, and I do appreciate the momentum in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Commissioner Adler, Commissioner Kay? We will call the vote on amendment number four, the Kay Adler number four. Commissioner Adler, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Kay? Aye. Commissioner Bioko? No. Commissioner Feldman? No. And I vote no. The nays are three, the ayes are two. This amendment does not pass. Is there another amendment? We have one more joint amendment, Madam Chair, that I'm going to offer now and hope that we can end batting 500 at least. We're, we're, we're right now, we're one for three. We're hoping to get two for four. So this is joint uh, K. Other Amendment uh, number five. And this, we're back to tip over, is a slightly different approach. And this works under the current uh, rulemaking authority, but really tries to refine the testing that staff is doing and really provide clarity for all, because there has been a lot of interest, understandably and appropriately so, in the type of testing that we're doing to make sure that when we do provide test results that everyone can have confidence that we've considered all the different scenarios. And I think that as we've learned through the tip over process, one of the troubling aspects is the agency will think it's moving on one path to solve the problem and then a new incident will occur a very troubling incident, and when we dig into that, we will recognize that maybe some of the technical solutions that we had thought would be the salvation are not, and that there are new incidents that can occur that can be confounding, and the point of this is to try to get ahead of that and to identify a way of testing that would anticipate those types of worst case scenario incidents and to be have better more robust testing so that after a year's worth of work a new incident doesn't occur and then we're back to the drawing board again so that's the point of this amendment thank you commissioner k is there a second I'll second, second. Thank you. Having heard a second, uh, Commissioner Kay, is there anything else you'd like to elaborate Nothing on? Nothing else. Amendment? Thank you. Thank you. We will uh, begin. Oh, Commissioner Adler, you have something to add. Um, first of all, uh, one of the reasons I think this is so important is because we don't want to have confusion, at least starting with ASTM, where they have received a strong signal that uh, if they were to change the standard to be 60 pounds and uh, under 30 inches that all would be well and I think this is an important clarification for them and for the staff I think the staff uh, understands this but it's to, in the interest of transparency to be absolutely explicit that this is what it's going to take in order to have a good tip over standard uh, which means 
assessing and crafting appropriate requirements for the dynamic challenge that furniture has when it comes to tip over incidents. So I'm a strong supporter of this. Thank you, Commissioner Adler. We will begin the commissioner's rounds of questions. Uh, I will begin. Um, I, I do want to clarify something that Commissioner Adler just said, and I, I think it's, and I'm not quite sure what you're referring to, but I'll just take responsibility for my letter to the ASTM committee um, and to industry, and that is that what was proposed to adopt the 60 pounds and to uh, consider the 27 inches and above height for clothing storage units was merely an interim step because of the very issue that Commissioner Kay has raised, and that issue is that um, there are these different incidents and deaths that have occurred that really have, um, I think, changed on some level how staff is thinking about this issue, and it certainly opens up a very large door as to there are other things we need to be considering at this point. Um, but I don't think now is the time because I think right now um, we're doing a substantial amount of testing to determine the best way to approach this issue. I believe we're on track to complete that work and to promulgate a notice of proposed rulemaking in the next fiscal year as outlined. I'm concerned that the commissioner's amendment presumes the outcome of our testing and directs the staff to do something before we know what the uh, before we know what we are doing and the testing has been completed. The amendment is also very prescriptive on certain points. And for example, it would direct the staff to develop test methods that account for the weight of the oldest child victims, as well as dynamic uh, testing and other factors. These may or may not reasonably coincide in the real world. The staff should be allowed to continue its methodical test program of which this agency has really committed resources and again this commission everyone up here at the dais and the staff consider this a priority for the agency to to find a solution for this problem um, i think that the staff should again be allowed to continue its methodical test program with a view towards developing strong proposals for improvements to the voluntary standards as well as a possible mandatory standard. To Commissioner uh, Adler's point earlier, something will happen. There, is, there are many moving parts to this issue. The Sturdy Act was introduced. They've reached out to this agency for technical support, and we have been uh, working with them. Uh, there are many things happening on this issue, knowing that it is a priority for so many, and something will happen, um, and so I think at this point, I cannot support this amendment. I think the things that are being done, the testing that's being done, we need to let that run uh, and be completed. Commissioner Bioko. No questions, thank you. Commissioner Feldman. My question is for the amendment sponsors. Um, would this project support or inform the agency's ongoing work with a seven and nine mandatory safety standard for tip over? Okay, thanks. I mean, yeah, this would be the the uh, the entirety of the work from a technical basis. Which, to the chairman's point, there are aspects of this already in the staff's testing protocol. But uh, I think the purpose of offering this is to just make sure that we're covering all of the actual real world scenarios that have come to our attention and anticipating others, as opposed to waiting for those to present themselves. Does that help? It does, and if there's a concern that the testing protocols that are 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 adopted um, are overbroad or incorrect or somehow deficient in the seven and nine process, there would be a procedural mechanism for the commission to revisit that and make adjustments as needed to make sure that uh, whatever testing mechanism the commission may ultimately adopt to be included in a seven and nine mandatory rule is consistent with our uh, requirement under APA not to proceed with something that's arbitrary and capricious and to make sure that it's uh, 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 narrowly but adequately addresses the, the immediate hazard in front of us. Is that correct? The short answer is yes. If, can I expand on that? Of course. I, I mean, you're correct, absolutely. I mean, this would only be the uh, guidelines for robust technical work by the staff, but ultimately whatever they would propose with or without this amendment would have to go through the same 
um, legally permissible process as required by both Section 7 and 9 of the Consumer Product Safety Act and, of course, the Administrative Procedures Act. Okay. Well, I, I want to commend you for your work and leadership on, on taking steps here to advance the issue. Um, I feel like I'm repeating myself a little bit, but uh, it, it's hard to overstate how pleased I am that there's some consensus on, on, on the commission uh, to address this in a, in a, a, a thoughtful and forward-leaning way. Uh, it's an issue that's been around for some time, and uh, I, I, I think this is a good amendment that advances the ball in a helpful way and uh, hopefully puts us in the posture that I, I think we all hope that we're in um, to move expeditiously to a mandatory standard here. So I think this is something I can support. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Feldman. Commissioner Adler, Kay, would you have additional comments? Uh, I appreciate the support from Commissioner Feldman and from anybody else. Uh, I just want to try to alleviate the chairman's concerns that we would be adding non-real world or um, sort of theoretical requirements to the testing. It, I, I feel like the purpose and the way we drafted it is actually quite the opposite, was to take all of the issues we've now become aware of through real incidents and uh, data that has actually been presented to the agency. And so if we didn't capture that, I apologize, but I feel like that was the intent of what we did try to do. Thank you, Commissioner Kay. Commissioner Adler? Um, just a quick reminder, none of this work would in any way be inconsistent with the development of a 104 rule. Forgive me for saying that. Uh, and I also think the importance of this, uh, and I really appreciate Commissioner Feldman's comments, is to send a signal not just to our staff, but it's to send a signal to the outside world about what the nature of an appropriate safety standard should be. And uh, there are times when I, I think we get uh, overly prescriptive and we engage in micromanagement and that does concern me. This one I don't think does that. Uh, that certainly wasn't the intention. So uh, again, we ap I appreciate the support. Chair, can I just add one more point? Sorry. I, I do think it's important to say that we, and we did mention at the end, there's two key sentences. Surrogate methods could be used to address all of these enumerated parameters and a dynamic approach could be used as the basis for static test. And, and while I realize that's a lot of technical garbled language. The point of that was to give staff some flexibility in how they went about this, and if they could figure out other ways to do it, of course, we would prefer them to do that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for Commissioner Adler, Commissioner Kay? I will call the vote on the Kay Adler tip over amendment number five. Commissioner Adler, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Kay? Aye. Commissioner Bielko? Aye. Commissioner Feldman? Aye. And I vote nay. So the uh, ayes are five, four, and the nays are one. This amendment passes as written. Are there any other amendments or motions uh, for the mid-year? Does that complete, I'm sorry, does that complete your? It, it does, thank you for um, enduring that. But is it, are you gonna offer yours to withdraw? To figure out the appropriate timing is this would this be an appropriate time to I bring up the fine. ombudsman yes. okay um you will notice that there is not being circulated uh, an amendment on uh, consumer ombudsman it's something that we've discussed and my staff has discussed with uh, our colleagues um, and i did want to say a few words about the notion of a con consumer ombudsman and explain why i've decided uh, to withdraw it at this point uh, so if you will indulge me, I just have a few minutes of comments. Uh, I want to point out for many years that the commission has had a small bus business ombudsman. I think that's one of the most successful things this agency's done. It's led to greater compliance with our regulations. It's led to more understanding of the agency and a lot of goodwill among our stakeholders. The time has really come for CPST to join at least a dozen other federal agencies who've established ombudsman offices with the primary function to work with one of their most important stakeholders, our most important stakeholders, the consuming public. Uh, there are lots of groups that historically have been underserved by the commission, and not just by this commission, but by others. Parents, parents groups, civic groups, affinity groups, public service groups, and let's not forget to mention individual consumers who live in small communities across the country and desperately need some focal point for their safety concerns. They deserve a friend and a friendly face in Washington every bit as much as members of the small business community do. Um, I just want to make one particular point about why this is so important. 
Uh, not that this is the only solution, but I think it's a critical solution to the concern that we heard from the parents against tip overs. These are families that have lost children in tip over accidents. Time and again, they told us about how indignity was piled on tragedy after a fatality had occurred. When people with the best of intentions were grilling them about the uh, tragic accident, uh, but it didn't come across that way. It came across as attack. Uh, and what they would need would be people who have a friendly ear and a willingness to explain why an investigation is so important. That's something a consumer ombudsman could do. A consumer ombudsman could also serve an important outreach uh, function for victims and victims' families. Right now, if you're a parent who's lost a, a child to some particular incident, there's not really a good clearinghouse. You may go on Facebook, you may find things through social media, but there ought to be a central place, uh, and that could be the consumer ombudsman for uh, helping organize and helping people who've suffered tragedies to work with one another. Um, what I would like to say is that um, I'm not offering this because I've had discussions with the chair about what the appropriate point in time to offer a proposal like this is, and we have a disagreement. Uh, I feel that any commissioner can offer anything at any point uh, as long as we understand, and I do agree with the chairman on this, that when the rubber hits the road where the resources are allocated, that occurs when it comes to the op plan. So I'm withdrawing this at the moment with the hope and the strong desire that uh, when we get to the op plan that I will have the support not just of the chairman but of all of my colleagues. So it's an amendment that I'm not offering, but I at least wanted to signal what my concern was, and I do thank you for uh, indulging me in making that point. Thank you, Commissioner Adler. Are there any other amendments to the 2019 mid-year plan? <clears throat> I do have a motion, not necessarily an amendment. That's exactly what I was going to call next. Are there any right. motions? <laughs> Would you like to explain your motion? Sure. <clears throat> I, I, will, I will read it into the record. I am moving the commission to appoint a detailee from the DOJ, the FBI, or other governmental agency with the appropriate experience and knowledge to assist, inform, and advise the commission on matters pertaining to the clearinghouse breach as described below. One, the detailee shall be selected and appointed by the full commission and shall start immediately upon appointment. Two, the detailee shall review and investigate the circumstances that gave rise to the breach and evaluate the steps taken to date by the agency and will take in the future to address the situation. Number three, the detailee shall brief the commission on a regular basis as required by the commission. Any briefing or portion thereof shall be public if deemed necessary by the commission and consistent with the applicable law. The detailee shall notify the commission of any legal interpretations by the office of the general counsel and that the, that the detailee deems relevant to his or her responsibilities, functions, or recommendations. Consistent with this authority, the commission shall have final say on any legal determinations or interpretations associated with the matter. Number five, the detailee shall report his or her initial findings to the full commission and advise the commission on any and all recommendations on how to proceed. The commission shall then vote on the recommendations. The detailee shall also recommend and direct the commission on how to best address and fully inform those impacted directly or indirectly by the breach. The commission shall vote on those recommendations and direct the detailee accordingly. The detailee shall have full cooperation of the staff, the agency staff, the members of the breach response team, and any and all agency employees who are working on the matter. And the detailee shall conduct any further activities as may be directed by a majority of the commission. I believe that the motion speaks for itself. Thank you, Commissioner Bielko. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, is there any additional uh, information you'd like to add or explanation before we proceed to our questions? There is not. Thank you. May, may I uh, inject a point of order, please? Uh, I have not seen this precise motion until just now. I didn't see a different version of this until 4 o'clock yesterday afternoon. Uh, this gets to the point that we've tried, uh, at least as a matter of comity, if we're going to introduce amendments to circulate those at least 24 hours before a commission meeting. Uh, I feel like I am somewhat caught somewhat flat-footed because I don't really understand the uh, all the nuances of this. So 
at least uh, in the interest of my ability to assess this, I would ask that we uh, take a break of, uh, say, one hour for me to go back and assess what uh, the full uh, dimensions of this proposal are. Are there any objections to taking a break for one hour to assess this uh, um, motion from Commissioner Bayoko? I'm, I'm, I question why it's needed. It's pretty straightforward. We need somebody to come in here with the requisite skills uh, and, and advise the entire commission. These are points that I have raised several times and they have fallen on deaf ears. I'm presenting the motion. This is nothing new, nothing that any of my colleagues have not heard before. It certainly is new to me, and uh, again, so much of what we address has to do with the devil being in the details. I don't know the details. I feel the need to assess, and, and this to me is, is a fairly big surprise, so uh, I renew my request that we take a, a one-hour break to assess this. Commissioner Adler, do you think that if we, were, um, if we spent some time asking questions that that would help uh, explain some of this motion? Uh, it might, but I, part of it is I don't know exactly which questions to ask. I know which questions I was prepared to ask of the earlier version, but I don't know what questions I would ask of this. Uh, and so I would, uh, I would like the ability to sit down calmly uh, to read this through and, to see, and see whether I have any questions or whether I would want to offer any amendments to this. I, I suggest that we uh, ask questions for a period of time, and then if you still feel the need to adjourn for one hour, uh, we, can, we can do that. I have no objection to that as well. This is, again, um, this is new to all of us here. Commissioner Kay? If I just make the clarification on that proposal, if it turns out that Commissioner Adler has additional questions after that, would he be permitted to ask those questions when we resume? So if we go with, okay, of great, course. thank you. Of course. So I will begin with the questions. Uh, I, I apologize, we, we do have a second, okay. Um, so I guess as in looking at this, my first question would be, what level of expertise would you envision for this person uh, in this detail -y? Well, um, as I've raised with you before, and as I've been speaking with the DOJ and the FBI, um, our sister agencies do have um, agents and uh, employees and lawyers who are uh, who do this on a daily basis. Whether it's for the government or for uh, industry, this is you know looking into a breach and evaluating it, helping an agency who's been through it shore things up. This is what they do on a daily basis. So th this is. Uh, the type of um, detail uh, that I would I would suggest. As I see it, the um, 6B is unique to this agency, and so they may have experts, but do they have experts that would understand 6B and the issue of disclosure? And before I get, and before I uh, allow you to answer, it, I really do wanna say that this issue has been a priority for this agency ever since it occurred. And um, it is something that the staff and all the commissioners, including myself as the acting chair, have taken very seriously. And we have devoted tremendous resources. We have, um, we have made it a priority. And along, um, not far into the disclosure I asked the in, ex Inspector General to um, to complete an investigation, and that is undergoing as we speak. He began immediately, um, but I want to go back to um, the question about: Is there someone at DOJ or FBI who is familiar with 6B and understands, as unique as that uh, statute is to this agency? Do they have that expertise to deal with? This? Yes, they do. They have that expertise. They have financial expertise. They have PII expertise or any other expertise um, that is necessary that it goes out the door um, in, a, in a disclosure of, of the nature we sustained. Um, and to address your point on the IG, uh, the IG has um, been issuing reports 
from as far as I can tell, since 2015 and have made recommendations that this agency hasn't accepted. So I, I'm looking forward to um, the IG in, uh, doing you know his part and, and reading that report, but I, I am not satisfied with where we are and where how you know to this point what we've done. I'm concerned that a lot of the evidence as to what really happened here is gone or um, is gone and I believe we need to be doing this in real time. Um, I, I, I appreciate that you're happy with the way that things have been going. I, I have reasonable minds can disagree here and I, I, I don't have a comfort level that it's been handled properly or thank completely. Thank you, I, um, I don't think I use the word happy. I don't think anyone is happy at this agency about this issue, but we're doing what we must do, and that's deal with the issue. I want to get back to the Inspector General, though, because I'm concerned is the feeling that his independent investigation is not sufficient and that he isn't qu qualified to conduct the investigation? Well, um, first of all, this is not his bailiwick. Secondly, uh, in, I, I think that our IG is a terrific, honest guy, but... Anne Marie, you can fire him at any time according to our statute. So I don't see that as independent. And thirdly, we have people within the government who do this on a daily basis. I am positive that our IG will give us some recommendations, but he is not in the position to do all of these steps that need to be done in an investigation like this. So do you envision the uh, IG conducting, completing his investigation, and then this person, this detailee would come in, or do you anticipate that they would be conducting an investigation at the same time? They're two different things, but the detailee, as I pointed out in the motion, shall start immediately upon appointment. So whether or not the IG is, has completed his investigation, Correct. they would be running parallel to each other. And there is no uh, dollar amount here associated with this detailee, uh, do you have a dollar amount? Are you aware? I do not, and it's a detail. Uh, details do cost the agency money. It would require money. Uh, not would, necessarily in this instance. Well, I think that we need HR here to talk to us, or uh, OGC, General Counsel, um, to talk to us about whether a detailee, it's very difficult to have this discussion, and I will, um, something that is, you know, on its face, there's just so many questions. What is the cost of getting a detailee? Do you anticipate anticipate an IAA? How, what is the relationship that we will have with whatever agency? So I will answer it this way. This uh, is something that uh, came, uh, came up um, yesterday. Um, I've done my best to uh, get as much information. If what I'm hearing is that you are coming up with excuses rather than progress on this particular motion, then that is indicative to me as to where you stand. But um, I would posit that um, all of these, you know, different this, that, or the other uh, can and will be worked out um, throughout the process and in front of the full commission, and we will address those points as we go. This needs to be done, and delaying it anymore is only going to hurt the agency further. Very difficult to make a decision because I am not weighing in on the merits of this. I'm trying to understand what the real life implications are to this agency. And I don't see a dollar amount. I don't see what mechanism would connect us with that agency. What if the agency doesn't agree to whoever we agree? What if they don't agree to testify to the commission on a weekly basis? What if that we're going to have a, a contract with another government agency and we have to agree on the terms? And they may not agree with these. And so if we vote for this motion, that creates a problem uh, as well. Um, I, my time has expired, and I will move to Commissioner Adler. Uh, thank you very much, and I, I do have a lot of questions. So first of all, just a clarification. I see in uh, number one, uh, this person shall be selected and appointed by the full commission. Then I go down to number four, and I see discussion about the commission. And then I go down to number eight, and I see a majority of the commission. Are those intended to be separate terms and concepts? Uh, they're intended to be the same thing, Bob. Uh, one of my uh, concerns is that the full commission or a majority of the commission has not had an opportunity to weigh in on several things uh, with, with regard to how this um, 
uh, investigation and response plan is proceeding. In fact, I saw an FAQ on our website that I knew nothing about. I, I never looked at, never approved it, never signed off on that. And um, when I use when I use the term commission, I intend it to mean all five of us and not limited to just one office. And do I? Um, well, this is my question. When you use f the term full commission at one point and you use the term majority of the commission, does that mean it needs to be a unanimous vote of the commission when you talk about full commission? No, it does not. It would it would. Apply. So there's no real distinction between where you use the word full and where you use the word majority. This is just a point of clarification. No. So my point, Bob, is that I would like... I'm just asking yeah, what yeah. the meaning is. Well, my point is it needs to be selected by... And I, your point's well taken. Um, I, I, I believe I, my, my main point here is that all five of us are involved and that we vote as a, as a commission and the majority of the vote as to how we proceed. So, so I you can make those adjustments. You dis, you you suggested that the inspector general could be fired by the chairman. I honestly don't know the answer to that. But I guess my question would be: uh, Could the detailee be fired by the commission? Uh, and if so, would it be uh, for cause, or would it be uh, uh, a, d d any decision that uh, or any? point that the commission felt that the person ought to be terminated? No, because he, he the detailee, he or, he or she, works for another agency, so we have no authority to fire them. I'm not uh, talking I, about firing from their agency. I'm talking about being fired as a detailee at this agency. Why would we want to do that? We're, this, the whole purpose of this is to get transparency and all of the facts, not just some of the facts as presented to us. So if you're looking, if you're starting off um, from a perspective of, let's see if we can fire the guy, um, that suggests to me that um, you're coming at this at the wrong point. I or just maybe you're just not interested. I would just like an answer. Can this person be removed by the commission for any reason whatsoever, or would there have to be cause? Uh, if it it, and not everybody, as we know, works out uh, when when they are assigned to do a job. I just I think like that to know. when and if that situation arises, um, a motion can be made, and we can consider that. But considering it doesn't tell me whether we would have the authority to do that. What I'd like before we do this is to know whether this person could be terminated by the commission at will, or whether it would be for cause. I think that would be a clarification that ought to be included in this proposal. Um, the the other point that I would uh, request, and I would like uh, information, this, my understanding is that uh, the detailee would be paid by the commission. Uh, if the detailee came on board, do we have any idea what the detailee's work plan would be? Would we not want to ask that the detailee at least give us some sense of what the work plan is that he or she would have and that we at least would share our vision of what should be done. Well, uh, and, and that therein begs the question. First of all, a detailee um, that, that I've been uh, researching would not have a dollar amount attached to it. Secondly, I, I'm going to come back to the same point. Either we want somebody with the requisite experience to come in and answer questions that at least this commissioner can't seem to get answered, or we don't. So I would encourage you to vote no if you don't want this person here, and I would encourage you to vote yes, and in the spirit of cooperation, we work together as a commission to get to the answers that we need to have. Uh, before I would uh, want to vote on this, I would ask uh, either the uh, executive director or the deputy executive director to tell me whether this is uh, an expense that the commission would have to, or the general counsel, excuse me, tell me whether this is an expense that the commission would uh, have to incur. I object to that. The, 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 these two individuals, this is not their motion. It is not for them to decide. They have not done the research, and uh, I am presenting it as is. Well, you can object to it, but the f point is I object to your objection. I would like to know what the answer to that question is before the commission in some fashion uh, commits itself to dedicating resources to this work. The Anti-Deficiency Act does require that the agency pay for any services that it receives. I don't believe that's correct. Well, that's yet another question that I think would have to be resolved before I would be comfortable voting uh, for such a, a broad and comprehensive motion. I see that my time has expired, this, at least for this round. Thank you. Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do appreciate the, um, 
the motivation of, of why Commissioner Bianco wants to try to do this. Um, I wanted to know, I guess the question is, are you open to amendments to your amendment? I know that we've been trying to work to get to a place of common ground. I, I think there have been some legitimate concerns raised about making sure to proceed in a manner that is consistent with our statute in terms of hiring authority and appointing authority, and I think those do need to be worked out, and I would hope you'd be open to that. Um, I do agree that there is benefit for us to have uh, expertise shared across the government for folks who do this on a regular basis. Thankfully, we don't have a lot of experience with this type of disclosure, and so I think that there is a benefit to trying to have additional eyes on it and to um, learn from the expertise. I don't have the same, while I understand the chairman's concerns that 6B is unique, uh, I'm actually much more concerned about the PII part, and I feel like that's bread and butter for other agencies, and it would be useful to uh, hear from them on it and to make sure that, uh, especially since this might not be our only PII issue, it would be good to have a better understanding of how to handle these things properly. Um, I'll reserve until later some of the other reasons why I'm supportive of this concept, but my main question is, uh, would you be willing, it sounds like we are going to take a break, can we work during that time to try to address some of the concerns to make sure that we're not running afoul of our statutes. Yes, of course. Great, thank you very much. Commissioner Feldman. Um, I have no questions at this time. I'm, I, I agree with Commissioner Biacco that the motion here does tend to speak for itself. Um, with respect to the point that you raised, Commissioner Kay, about uh, sensitivity to making sure that we're, particularly with respect to the appointment language proceeding under the statute, um, this would be section, uh, 4F1 outlines that appointments and supervision of personnel um, falls to the chair or the acting chair, uh, but that extends only to personnel employed under the commission. I think there's a, a legitimate question of to the extent that we're contemplating bringing on a detailee that would be employed under a sister agency, whether or not that language of the statute would be applicable here. Um, I, I, I don't even think that's an open question. I think the language in the statute speaks for itself. But uh, you know, if, if we are going to recess, um, it would be my preference that we proceed with a, a, a vote here. Um, but uh, but, but uh, it, it, if this is a, a conversation that, that, that you'd like to continue, I'm happy to continue it. Mr. Kay? Uh, sure, I guess I can respond. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that if we're going to proceed uh, out of an abundance of caution, and I that sounds reasonable, your legal interpretation, but out of an abundance of caution, there's probably a way to fiddle with the drafting to not change the scope and the purpose and the intent behind it, but just to be a little bit more buttoned up in terms of not potentially tripping over that issue. So that would just be my suggestion. And we'll, we'll circulate some proposed edits, and if they work, they work. If they don't, they don't. Uh, I don't think that, I, I totally get the frustration and the time pressure. I do think that uh, if it's the difference between getting it right or not, whether it's an hour or a day or whatever, I do think it might be worth taking that time. But if we can get it right or it can be gotten right in an hour, then that works out too. Thank you, Commissioner Kay. I have additional questions uh, that I'd like to just talk a little bit about this morning um, so we don't know how much it's going to cost is there going to be any um, desire to find that out do we know what this entails if we contemplated I mentioned this earlier asked this earlier an IAA an MOU how, what is the mechanism with the agency so, Anne Marie, let me po pose, pose it this way. The agencies had detailees in the past, and if what I'm hearing from you is that these, um, you know, small issues that we all know we can work out um, are is what's going to stop you from voting, then don't vote for it. I think that speaks very loudly. If you want to help get this person in here, I think you're very well uh, positioned to help us do that. I'm not sure if this motion, and I, I, I am not speaking on the merits of this motion. Let me be really, really clear. 
but it's hard to even form an opinion when there's such broad language and this sort of notional idea of what you're aspiring to. And well, we, let me address it this way. I've come to I'm you with very with detailed um, information on this that you've rejected. So I've put it in writing from a broad perspective to uh, allow you to fill in areas that you were concerned with, which I still haven't heard, um, other than money. Um, either we want this person here or we don't. We can get them here and get them moving. I've been asking for this person since I first learned of this situation. Um, I would ask that we vote. If you want to take some time to give some edits, I'm willing, to, I'm open to edits. I'm certainly not um, close to edits, but I, I, I don't want to uh, have edits change the dynamic of what it is that I think this agency needs, and I feel very strongly that this agency needs. And I find the, the pushback very telling. Well, please don't misinterpret my, uh, my interest in how we would possibly, as an agency, execute what it is you've put here on paper. Um, maybe it's because you're new, you're a newer commissioner, but when we, you, you, everything we do, it's either staff hours or contract dollars, just because of the size of this agency and just because of the limited budget that we have. So if you can come back with a dollar amount and we can f determine exactly from HR whether or not this is a detailee, do we pay for the detailee, what is the cost of the de de detailee, are you aware that our general counsel has spoken to justice, has spoken to FBI? I am aware that our general counsel is not independent is controlling the information that we get. And the last few pieces of advice, legal advice I've gotten from our general counsel have been flat wrong. So forgive me if I don't feel comfortable, which is why I'm moving again to get some outside independent help. And I beg to differ with you. I do know how to present a motion, and I've presented this motion in a manner that I believe is appropriate. If you don't want to vote for it, don't vote for it. I think when you present a motion, you have to have some concept of the cost, the impact on the agency, uh, all of the questions. We haven't even decided and determined. I personally disagree with Commissioner Feldman that 4F1 doesn't apply here, because, but, but that's a legal question that needs to be determined. Uh, so there's just many, many obstacles. I won't call them obstacles, I'll call them thresholds that we've got to get to before we can make an informed decision. Okay. Then let's not waste the time. The motion is in front of us. It's been seconded. Let's vote. I would ask that you would table the motion until uh, we get some of the answers to this question. So I, I'm not I, opposed I'm to not it. I'm not willing to do that. It is a, a valid motion, seconded, on, and it's um, ripe, for, ripe for vote. I would second the motion to table. Any discussion about tabling the motion, Commissioner Kay? Uh, I just want to see clarification. So are we taking the break for an hour and then coming back and then resuming? Is that what the proposal is? That's I what a motion to table is. You come back and then you vote. You don't put it off indefinitely. Okay, because if I'm voting to table, it would be a very small temporary table of an hour so that we would come back and then we would resume with the hope that we could continue to work out language that would work. That would be my intent. Is uh, there a desire to have staff here at the table to answer questions? Not by me. Commissioner Adler? Yes. Commissioner Kay? If any one commissioner needs to have staff, then I would support that. Commissioner Feldman? Okay. Uh, there is a motion to take a, an adjournment. It is now 11.30. And um, we will adjourn until 1 p.m. Is that satisfactory for all? The only issue for me, Madam Chair, is just from previous commitments that I have to be out by 2. And so I would request that if we can't start earlier, then we, if we're not done by 2, then we just reconvene when either tomorrow, or I know Commissioner Adler is not here, then Thursday or whatever works next. That's why Thank I keep you. coming back to the point. I can see this. This is like the tip overs. Let's see how long we can drag this out. Either you vote, you have a vote for it as presented. I don't didn't love the things that everybody else presents along the way. Um, if you don't want to vote for it, say you don't want to vote for it, and and be transparent about it.
Well, I guess since no one else is talking, I'll keep talking. But um, I actually would like to vote for it. I would just like to have a lot more comfort with certain aspects of it. So we've obviously gone back and forth a number of times, and I don't feel like there's that much distance. So at least speaking for myself, if we can get over that final hurdle, I'd be good with it. And I think the time would actually help in that regard. Okay, let's do it. We will adjourn this uh, mid-year decision. I think there's agreement, but Commissioner Adler? Uh, I would vote yes. Commissioner Kay? Yes. Commissioner Bioko? Sure. Commissioner Feldman? And I vote yay. Uh, the ayes have it. So we will adjourn this meeting until 1 p.m., uh, and then we will have additional discussion. We will reconvene this uh, public hearing of CPSC. We'll take back up the issue that's on the table, the 2019 mid-year plan. Currently on the table, just to uh, make sure we're all in the same place, um, Commissioner Biacco uh, made a motion, uh, and there has been some discussion. There was a request for time uh, off or time a recess so we could talk about it, see if there wasn't a path forward with what she had proposed. Um, <clears throat> so I think at this time I'll ask whether or not there are any amendments to Commissioner Biacco's amendment. I think maybe the, the better way to do it is let me introduce the, the um, motion as it's been amended. And um, this, is, this is the motion I'm willing to put forward having considered everybody's input. Well, the problem is we have your original amendment on the table, so you'll... I'm happy <coughs> to withdraw it, and I'll introduce a new one. Okay. okay. Um, <coughs> and I'll read it into the record. I move the commission to approve the agency Excuse to... Excuse me one second. Do we have copies of the amendment? I did it in black line so you can see it. <clears throat> I move the commission to approve the agency to work with a detainee from the DOJ FBI, or I'm sorry, detailee, um, from the DOJ FBI or other governmental agency with the appropriate experience and knowledge to assist, inform, and advise the commission on matters pertaining to the clearinghouse breach as described below. Number one, the detailee shall be approved by the commission and shall start immediately. Two, the detailee shall review and investigate the circumstances that gave rise to the breach and evaluate the steps taken to date by the agency and will take in the future to address the situation. Three, the detailee shall brief the commission on a regular basis as requested by the commission. Any briefing or portion thereof shall be public if deemed necessary by the commission and consistent with all applicable law. The detailee shall notify the commission of any legal interpretations by the Office of the General Counsel that the detailee deems relevant to his or her responsibilities, functions, or recommendations. Consistent with, this, with its authority, the commission shall have final say on any legal determinations or interpretations associated with this matter. The detailee shall report his or her finding, initial findings to the commission and advise the commission on any and all recommendations on how to proceed. The detailee shall also advise the commission on how to best address and fully inform those impacted directly or indirectly by the breach. The detailee shall have the full cooperation of the agency staff, the members of the breach response team, and any and all agency's employees who are working on the matter. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Feldman. Uh, at this time, then, we will open up... Um, from the commissioners, any questions that they might have? Commissioner Adler. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chairman, and I appreciate uh, Commissioner Biacco trying to accommodate some of the concerns that have been raised. Uh, I still have a couple of questions about this. Uh, first of all, um, during the prior discussion, you had made the statement that the IG could be removed by the chairman uh, at will, and I think the, uh, I checked with the IG, and I don't think that's correct. I think, according to the IG, the, this person can't be fired, the IG can't be fired without two-thirds of the vote of the commission. I bring that up because I don't see anything in your proposal about what would happen in the event that the commission, for whatever reason, decided to remove the detailee. Would that be done by, uh, for cause only, or would that be done at will? Bob, well, I think we ought to vote on getting the detailee here instead of worrying about already firing them before they get here. 
Well, a lot of times you need to plan something before you actually move to implementation. I'd like to have a clearer idea of what your notion is of what would happen in the event something goes wrong. I mean, in other words, we went to law school learning the dark side of every proposition. And in this case, I'd like to have your opinion about what would uh, happen if the commission were suddenly to decide this person was not doing a job that we expected the person to do. First of all, um, the uh, motion is presented as is, but uh, if you want my opinion, I think what would happen is the commission um, would discuss the matter if and when that, ar that arose and make the appropriate determination um, with the appropriate um, corresponding agency. But would that be at will or would that be for cause? In other words, if we're bringing this person on board, the circumstances under which he or she comes ought to be clear to the detailee and ought to be clear to the members of the commission. Bob, I don't have an answer for you. I'm right now worried about getting somebody in here to do the job and not firing them. Um, well, okay. Uh, let me ask a question about uh, uh, paragraph five. I see that the detailee is supposed to report his or her initial findings. I don't see anything in there in your motion for final findings. Is, is, are the initial findings supposed to be the ultimate findings? Of course not. That's why they're called initial findings. Well, then where is the provision about uh, final findings? Well, they're supposed to, my, my thought is that they can advise the commission on how to proceed, um, and we would do that on a, a, a weekly, frankly, a weekly basis so that we can make decisions in real time to move on. Um, this is I, don't, not, I, I believe the IG is going to be giving us a final report. I'm not interested in a report. I'm interested in having somebody with experience get in here already two months later in real time and respond to what they're seeing in real time. Well, actually, I am interested in a report. My next question is that actually not to Commissioner Biacco, but it is to staff, and that is, have we gotten clarification about whether the commission is obligated to pay the detailee or not? Yes, uh, we have had that legal advice guidance. We have uh, both paid when uh, on for reimbursement and receive reimbursement when we've had detailees in both those situations. Uh, one of the questions that I think keeps coming up is about cost and without knowing duration the grade of whoever the commission would select if this passed you can't give exact estimates but if you use the worst case estimate a, a gs-15 step 10 the highest paid and in, in the gs scale for a year you're looking upwards of two hundred thousand dollars for one fte for one year but so just to give some perspective on any cost implications on that. And may I point out that in the mid-year, we were voting in terms of priorities on items that are $75,000, and because I don't really have a good sense of what the resources are, this does give me pause about uh, committing sort of an open-ended uh, uh, agreement with a, uh, with a detailee. Uh, my final question would be, uh, this says the detailee shall have the full cooperation of the agency staff. Uh, could you explain a little more what that means? If the detailee says to a staff person, I need this uh, information from you, and the staff person says it will take me four days to do that, does the detailee have the authority to say, well, you must do it because the commission has approved that you provide full cooperation? I, I believe that's how I would read it. Okay, I, th those are all the questions I have at this point. Thank you, Commissioner Kay. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, thanks, Commissioner Bianco, for uh, working with us to try to get to a common ground. Uh, my sense is that you, the motion that you have offered this afternoon is, is your final, that's your final say on it, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. I have no more, no more further questions. Thank you, Commissioner Feldman. I have no questions at this time. Thank you. Um, I do have a couple of follow-up questions, um, particularly from this morning and our conversation about this. Have we um, have we determined what kind of agency agreement there would be and who would be responsible for putting that agreement together? We have not. And to Bob's question, it may be uh, in terms of the interagency agreement, it may be p possible to 
um, <clears throat> discuss whether that person would be fired at will or for cause. Those kinds of details could be ironed out in that agreement. Is that or could? Um, <clears throat> I don't have any other questions, Commissioner Adler. I'm trying to be cognizant of Commissioner uh, Kay's need to leave at 2 o'clock, and I don't want my amendments to take up an excessive amount of time. So uh, I have distributed the amendments, and in the interest of time, may I ask that they be considered sort of in bulk with, uh, w without having to describe each and every one of them. I'm delighted to respond to any questions that you might have about the amendments. Thank you, thank you Commissioner Adler. Yes, I, I am a mo I'm moving these four amendments, assuming that meets approval of the commission. <coughs> no. So you will not explain it. We we'll just hear a second. Uh, I'm I'm delighted to do a very quick explanation. Okay, sure. So if you look at uh, the first amendment, uh, we have a superb inspector general who cannot be easily removed from office. He is investigating this. I see no reason to uh, have a detailee brought in to do a simultaneous investigation, possibly stepping on the inspector general's toes, possibly interfering with what the inspector general is doing until we have had a report from the inspector general. So the first one is, uh, let's wait to see about hiring a detailee until the inspector general has issued its, uh, his or her report. The uh, second proposal is to say that uh, with respect to resources, if we're going to hire a detailee, I think we should do the way we do with anybody that comes in as a consultant or contractor. They come in and consult with us. We give them a general idea of what we would like them to do, and then we ask them to submit a work plan. So what I've done is listed the kind of work plan that I would ask them to submit after they've consulted with us and gotten a good idea about what we have in mind for their investigation. The... Um, Third one uh, goes to the point that the chairman was raising. Detailee may have tremendous insight and uh, knowledge about the privacy acts and about uh, PII, but will have zero uh, knowledge of Section 6B, which was the original impetus for uh, concern. And so uh, what I'd like to do, especially if we're going to have discussions in a public forum, I would like the uh, detailee to certify that he or she knows about 6B and that we're not going to have another inadvertent disclosure during the course of a public forum. And the fourth point, again, goes to resources. We have a protocol at the commission now that's written down that says in the event any commissioner wants to use up more than two hours of a staff person's time, there, you must get permission from the chairman. But I know that Commissioner Biacco uh, wants to have the commission involved in decisions like that. So that's why I put uh, we'll not be able to task uh, a staff person to do uh, more than two hours of time without getting permission from the commission. So those are my amendments. Thank you. So I, um, <clears throat> you are offering, I just want to be clear for the record, you're offering four amendments to Commissioner Viaco's amendment to her amendment to the mid-year. That is correct and well stated. And her motion, I apologize. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, I don't want amendments. The motion, I, I have amended it. I have considered those amendments, which is why we took the break. I have presented a motion. It has a second. We've had discussion. The, the proper um, form right now is to call for a vote on it. I don't think that's correct. I think whenever anybody has put in a motion, even an amendment, uh, Robert's rules say you can amend the amendment, and that's what I'm proposing to do. I haven't gotten a second yet, but uh, that's what I'm proposing to do. And so it's my opinion we need four seconds. You have four amendments, so four seconds to your amendments. Yeah. You're going to move them in block? They, uh, yes, I have moved them in block. Um, <clears throat> I second. Are there questions for Commissioner Adler? No, no questions, thank you. Michael? Nope. Commissioner Feldman? I have no questions uh, other than to say that um, I welcome an independent investigation. 
I have no problem with that at all. And I, I do think, though, we have an inspector general to what Commissioner Adler said in his comments, who knows this agency. And I think it's reasonable for him to complete his investigation. And then at that time, whether he makes a recommendation to us or whether we determine as a commission that we want to take further steps, I have no problem with any of that. But my concern is that we interfere with the investigation that the inspector general is doing. And I, unlike some of my colleagues, I, f I have confidence in him that he will do an independent and a thorough investigation of this agency. So I will call the vote for the uh, NBOG um, amendments from Commissioner Adler. Uh, I vote aye on all four amendments. Commissioner Kay? No. Commissioner Bielko? No. Commissioner Feldman? No. And I vote uh, aye on all four amendments. We will now uh, go back to um, the revised amendment to Commissioner Bioko's amendment um, that she has presented today. Uh, are there any other questions before we take a vote? <clears throat> I apologize, I keep saying amendment, but it is a motion. Um, I have no more questions, but I just wanna say that since I won't get a chance when I vote, that um, it sounds like we're not gonna quite bridge the gap and I'm disappointed in that, but I do think that you've raised really important issues. I, having nothing to do with, with the Inspector General, because I think he'll, he can do a great job, I just think this is a different assignment. It is. And that what has driven my interest in this the whole time are really two factors. One is that we don't have a lot of experience with PII breaches, which is a good thing. Nobody really wants to have a lot of experience with that. And so because we don't have a lot of experience, I'm not comfortable that we necessarily uh, nailed it the first time, and I would be more comfortable knowing that we had that kind of review, and I don't think that that's also something that uh, the Inspector General necessarily, one, has a lot of experience with, and even if he does, I don't think it's gonna be a quick review, whereas if we have to correct that, we'll have time to correct it immediately. And so I'm particularly concerned about the people whose PII has been um, put out there and put at risk, and if there was a different choice that should have been made, I would like to have known that now. And the second aspect, which I've also raised on numerous occasions, is I think it's an egregious error to keep Clearinghouse under FOIA any longer. That shouldn't have been put under FOIA other than the immediate, I get putting it under FOIA right away just as a stop, but I think enough time has passed. We should take it out from under FOIA, and I don't think an inspector general is gonna get to that, and even if he does, again, by the time he gets to it, it'll already be solidified, or people have gotten used to the custom of it being under FOIA. As it's been pointed out, you can't create a new document under FOIA, and so I don't even understand, even if it's under the FOIA office, but it's not being run through FOIA, what that even means. I think it's a big mistake, and this is another area that I would have liked looked at by an independent person in real time to try to address that decision. I think there's other areas where we haven't lined up in our interests, and that is probably why we're not gonna come to an agreement, but it's not the last time that we can consider this. If there's a chance to consider in the future, I'm certainly agreeable to do that. Thank you. Commissioner Bioko, do you have any other comments or questions? Not. Commissioner Feldman? No questions at this time, thank you. Thank you. I will comment on what Commissioner Kay just said because um, there's never been an intention that the clearinghouse would remain under the FOIA office. Um, I think that it was done as an interim step to mitigate and to make sure that thing, uh, eyes were being put on, that the appropriate eyes were do doing the review. But it's, I think it's important to note that that is not the way it's going to be, and uh, we will determine what the appropriate course is. But I do think it's prudent, very prudent, to wait for the Inspector General to, to um, give us his findings of his investigation and uh, make it clear as to what, um, what the next step should be and how we should handle that, this the entire situation. Well, on that note then, I would like to point out that the Inspector General has given us um, a 2015 and a 2018 uh, recommendation that we did not follow either that perhaps may have changed the uh, 
trajectory here. So why we would all think that this new report would be something that everybody's going to follow is beyond me. But that's what I see. If I could just make a point of clarification on that, what was done in 2015, and I don't disagree with you, there were aspects of that report that were not executed and were, the advice wasn't taken, but what is being done now is, is an investigation, it's not an audit. And those are two very different um, models from the IG and, and what he is trying to accomplish here with the request to investigate the situation. Are there any other questions, comments from the dais? At this time, then I will call. Oh, I apologize, Bob. I'm not sure if this is the appropriate time to discuss the uh, amendment, but it looks like we're about to vote on it, so I do have a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, uh, I just hope that in the future, if somebody is going to drop an amendment on us of this uh, uh, magnitude, that we get it well in advance so that we can all think about it and not have to uh, interrupt a meeting to go back and look at it and ponder it. Uh, but I also want to uh, make a couple of points. Um, this is a significant breach. I don't think anybody denies that. I think we all share that. But let's also try to put this in context. This is not the crime of the century. This is not Watergate. This is not Russian hacking of our files. This was an innocent mistake made by some well-intentioned staff who have owned up to what they've done that has led to a very quick reaction uh, and an attempt to solve this by the agency that in, uh, committed enormous resources of this agency uh, that came at a cost of working on projects that relate to safety. Uh, and this detail is just going to add to that drain on our commitment to do work uh, with respect to resources that ought to be better spent doing safety work. Um, this is, to me, and I can't say it uh, any more, more bluntly than that, this is a direct repudiation of the integrity and capability of our staff that's been brought to bear on this issue. And this is a, a proposition that I fundamentally reject. I think we have an excellent staff that has worked uh, in extremely efficient and competent manner to address this. It's also uh, implicitly a repudiation of the integrity and capability of our Inspector General. Uh, I have tremendous faith in him. I will say that I, when I was acting chair, uh, I worked closely with him. He is incredibly thorough. He is an incredibly aggressive uh, Inspector General. And I am afraid that this detailee is going to come in and immediately start encroaching and stepping on the legitimate work of the Inspector General. And I find that. Uh, quite disturbing. Uh, this also, to me, uh, less so than when it was first uh, offered, but it still gets us into micromanagement of any investigation the detailee would do. Uh, and uh, I just can't help reflecting, Commissioner Kay, that when you were chair, if you'd seen an amendment like this, I suspect your reaction would not have been as supportive as it is now. I certainly appreciate the goodwill and the good faith that this has been brought before the commission, but I fundamentally, deeply oppose this amendment. Thank you, Commissioner Adler. Commissioner Kay, anything to add? Commissioner Bioko, Commissioner Feldman. Uh, I just would um, echo what my colleague said, and that is um, it is a repudiation of the Inspector General's office. It is a, um, and that concerns me. I think that uh, what Commissioner Adler proposed in his first, well, his, the First Amendment of his group of amendments with regards to a timeline and not starting anything until the Inspector General finished his his investigation, I think, would have been a prudent way for this agency to go. It makes sense at that time. And, and the normal course of business from the IG would be to make a recommendation, if he sees anything of concern to him, criminal or otherwise, what happens in the normal course is then that investigation t would take place. And he would make that referral. And I wonder if you... If we contact justice and we say to them, we need you to do an investigation, they're going to probably say to us, why isn't your IG doing the investigation? So I think that there's a lot of pieces here uh, 
but I have confidence in the IG, and I do believe he will provide us with the information we need and make an appropriate recommendation as to whether or not this, um, this should be referred or there should be further action on it. Well, let me be clear about something. I am not, this is not a repudiation of our IG. In fact, if I recall correctly, I'm the person who informed the IG when our general counsel told us she'd get to him when he got back from vacation. Um, I have been working with our inspector general and find him highly competent and to be an honest guy. This is not, has nothing to do with the inspector general, number one. Number two, I, I resent the comment that this is a repudiation of our staff because the chair's office has controlled this commissioner's ability to even talk with staff members. I send a staff member a request to, to get together and I'm told either it has to go through Patty Hands, it has to go through the chair's office, and I'll get back to you with your questions um, once the chair approves it. I have a problem with that. And number three, you can speculate all you want about what the DOJ would say. I actually spoke with them. So I I find it interesting that I'm the only commissioner who reached out to look into all the different ways we can do this in the best possible um, um, way. I think that is our obligation. And the fact that I am being fought every step of the way speaks highly to me. Commissioner Feldman? Commissioner Adler? Okay. Um, I, I guess then I have a question because with regards to if you were not impugning the IG in his investigation, then why does it say shall review and investigate the circumstances that gave rise to the breach? Because I think there's more than just what the IG is tasked with looking at by your office. Let's call for the vote. I I'm, I'm done talking. Let's call for the vote. Um, I'll call the vote. Commissioner Adler, how do you vote? No. Commissioner K. No. Commissioner Bioko. Yes. And it's Bioko. Commissioner Feldman. Yes. And I vote no. Uh, the uh, noes have it. The ayes are two. The noes are three. The, the uh, motion, the amendment to the motion from Commissioner Bioko does not pass. Apologize. Okay, we will now vote on. Are there any other motions here today at the dais in regards to the 2019 mid-year? At this point, we will now vote on the underlying uh, document, the 2019 mid-year plan, as amended by the um, motion or the, the amendments. Commissioner Adler, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner K. Aye. Commissioner Bayoko. I have no idea what you're talking about. I thought we've already voted on the mid-year things. No, we voted on a series of amendments, and then we vote, just voted on your motion, or your amendment to your motion. It was a standalone motion, just so we're clear. You need to get Robert's Rules of Orders. Aye. Commissioner Feldman? Aye. And I vote aye. Uh, the mid-year is a, uh, passed as uh, amended. Uh, I will now ask my colleagues if they have any closing uh, remarks or if they will just uh, post their statements on their website. Uh, nothing nothing to say at this time. Commissioner Kay? I'll post later. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Bioko? Okay. Commissioner Feldman? That concludes this public hearing of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. Thank you.